In the 1920s, when the infant Hollywood was already dominating the cinema all over the world, and continental Europe opted to forge an artistic approach to film, the British film industry was struggling. And that's putting it mildly. Despite showing early promise in terms of creativity, talent, innovation and business acronym, after the war Britain found it hard to recapture that initial exciting potential. It wasn't held by the Hollywood studios block booking cinemas around the country. By 1924 the majority of British film studios were closing and only 5% of films released were produced at home. Things were so desperate that the government passed the Cinematograph Films Act in 1927 which meant that British cinemas had to show a quota of British produced films, with the quota varying between 7.5% and 20% over the preceding decade. This resulted in an industry that valued quantity over quality. The same year a film would not only be lauded as the first great British film, but signalled the start of one of the most industrious careers in the history of cinema. The Lodger, a story of the London Fog, is often considered the first great Hitchcock film, not only by critics and film historians, but by the master director himself. It was in fact his third film, the first being The Pleasure Garden, and the second, the now lost Mountain Eagle. In 1927, both those films had been shelved due to their suspiciously foreign and artistic aesthetic. Incidentally, that's why The Lodger has the subtitle, The Story of the London Fog, just to emphasise that it was British. Many of the themes and visual traits that the director would use throughout his career, a tortured male with a secret to hide, an obsession with blonde women, the hunted innocent man, as well as his iconography, the suspenseful point of view shots and expressionistic camera angles are all present in this early work, hence this being recognised as the first Hitchcock film. The Lodger is based on a story by Marie Belloc Lowndes, who drew inspiration from a conversation at a party with a landlady who believed her lodger to be the notorious Jack the Ripper. Some have indicated that the account may have come from the artist Walter Sickert, who has been named as a suspect by many Ripperologists as well as author Patricia Cromwell. Hitchcock had been interested in the story having seen upstage production in his teens. The Lodger is often considered a Jack the Ripper film, but it is more of a mythical retelling moulded from the events rather than a dramatic reconstruction. First of all, the killer is called the Avenger and leaves a calling card at each murder with the Avenger and a triangle printed on it. The triangle is a visual trait throughout the film and is symbolic of the love triangle that is central to the plot. The film is very much set in the 1920s, not the 1880s. We see cars, we see flappers, we see the flashing lights of a musical review, Golden Curls. Now we never actually see the show, but the lights seem to subtly indicate to the audience that sex is very much on display. And it almost inadvertently advertises another murder of a curly-headed blonde. The Lodger is not so much about the crimes themselves, but the impact of the murders, from the terrified victims to witnesses, through to the media and then to the public at large. And the Buntings are part of that public, emotionally affected by the crimes, without being directly involved. The majority of the action takes place within their home, initially seen as a congenial place of warmth and safety, which increasingly turns into one of unease, suspicion and danger. The Buntings are former domestic servants and this is still implied in the film. Despite the considerable size of the domain, they live at the bottom of the house, below street level and are ill at ease upstairs. To some extent they are content with their lives and their only desire is to see their daughter, Daisy, settled with a family friend and detective, Joe. The Buntings' simple lives and plans are thrown into turmoil when a new lodger arrives, bringing with them a sense of foreboding and dread, changing their lives forever. The lodger's arrival is declared from a point of view shot of a shadow moving towards the front door and a flicker from the gas lamp. Mrs Bunting opens the door and we see a tall masked figure engulfed with the London fog. 
His frantic eyes burn into her and the old lady feels unnerved. Yet he is clearly a gentleman and aware of her station in life, she allows him into the house and subservently shows him to the rooms. Unlike her mother, Daisy meets the lodger with a carefree air, unalarmed at his odd behaviour but still curious. Despite what the Buntings may want, Daisy, with her short hair and fashionable dress, is a modern woman of the 1920s. She strives for more than a life of domestic servitude, indicated when Jo cuts a heart out of cookie dough and she playfully rejects it. Earning an independent wage, she serves as a mannequin for affluent clientele, a class that her parents once served that now want to emulate the vision of her for themselves. She is at ease on the upper floors, in contrast to her parents, and strives to move above the modest and unassuming circumstance of her parents. She is the embodiment of that post-war youth and hope, something close to how Hitchcock himself must have felt. Entering films as a title card creator in 1919, Hitchcock quickly rose up the ranks by taking on every task that the studio required, from scenario writer to art director, initially with the famous players Lafsky and latterly Gainsbourg. Hitchcock found a champion in Gainsbourg's young director of production, Michael Balkin, who designated Hitchcock an assistant director to the studio star director, Graham Cutts. After completing the successful Woman to Woman, Hitchcock, along with editor and future wife Alma Revel, travelled to Germany to make The Black Guard. Director Cutts, whose personal life was apparently affecting his professional output, was increasingly irritated by his assistant, feeling that Hitchcock was a snotty upstart, though Michael Walken put it down to professional jealousy. Despite the conflict, Germany proved to be a learning curve for Hitchcock. He indulged himself in the culture, reading the Grimm Brothers and E.T.A. Hoffman, which combined the real world with the grotesque, horror with comedy. Hitchcock biographer Donald Spotto wrote, Each shot in the best German post-war cinema has a menacing, anxious, waiting quality, a quality of disequilibrium, and it is precisely this quality that informs the best moment of Hitchcock's later black and white work. While the Black Guard was in production at Ufa, Fritz Lang was filming Denis Belugin and Murnau was filming The Last Laugh with Emile Jannings. Hitchcock and Murnau had very different personalities but they formed an acquaintance and the Englishman briefly shadowed the director, taking in what he could. Not just the technical aspects of lighting, sets and perspective, but the overall aesthetic. Hitchcock often quoted Murnau, what you see on the set does not matter. All that matters is what you see on the screen. And this became his mantra. Reality isn't significant if the image is compelling. Hitchcock would carry what he learned in Germany throughout his career, but is presented in its purest form in The Lodger. As a director, Hitchcock's first two films, The Pleasure Garden and The Mountain Eagle, were shot in Germany, but were immediately shelved. C.M. Wolfe was a major film distributor and provided financial backing to early Gaumont films, later becoming the studio's chairman. Wolfe immediately took a dislike to Hitchcock's work, finding them too European and artsy for British tastes. However, Balkan was more confident in Hitchcock's talent and suggested that this despondent young director film The Lodger as a vehicle for matinee idol Ivor Novello. In the opening moments of The Lodger, we see glowing lampposts on the Thames embankment pierce through the thick London fog as a woman's body is found, a powerful reflection of the Jack the Ripper case. Hitchcock was no tourist to these events in location or time. Born only a decade after the killings and raised five miles away from Whitechapel, Jack the Ripper was a very terrifying living memory to those around him. Hitchcock claimed that he had wanted the film to end on an ambiguous note, with the mysterious lodger disappearing into the London fog, with the buntings in the audience questioning if he is the killer, the uncertainty echoing the unresolved Jack the Ripper murders. The problem with this was that Ivor Novello was a matinee idol. Novello was a playwright and songwriter mostly remembered for the World War I song, Keep the Home Fires Burning. In the 1920s, Novello's star shifted into sexy leading man status, the British Valentino. In the 1925 film The Rat and its sequel, he portrayed a dangerous scoundrel that was irresistible to women with a hint of vulnerability. As a heartthrob, it was fine for him to be dark and enigmatic, but unacceptable for him to be a villain, specifically a serial killer. 
At the film's conclusion, Hitchcock had to make it really clear that Novell's character was innocent. Despite his very odd, suspicious behaviour at the start, we find out that the nameless lodger is actually the brother of the first victim and is trying to track the killer himself. Hitchcock would latterly criticise this decision, even though this would not be the first time he would be forced to extricate the romantic lead. However, this is the start of the Hitchcock trait of the innocent man on the run from the 39 steps to North by Northwest, the wrong man and frenzy. The fine line between innocence and guilt is often explored by the director, however in The Lodger we see the main character nearly beaten to death by an angry mob, which seems more in line with German silent cinema. However, part of the blame for The Lodger's near murder must lie at the feet of Joe. Many of Hitchcock's female leads have amiable police boyfriends, but Joe lets his jealousy get the better of him and it dictates most of his decisions. In the actual Whitechapel case, the police were regularly derided for their inability to catch the Ripper, but Hitchcock famously had a fear and mistrust of the police, which seemed to stem from a famous incident in his childhood. At the age of five, the director's father sent him a note to the local police station where the local Bobby promptly locked him in a cell for an hour, telling him this is what we do to naughty boys. It became an anecdote that Hitchcock told in interviews and lectures, but it clearly traumatised him. Also, Hitchcock had encountered real life crime in his personal life. In 1923, Edith Thompson and her lover Freddie Bywaters were accused of murdering Thompson's husband Percy and were sent to the gallows. The case caused a media sensation in its day, mainly there was no evidence that Edith knew anything about the plan to kill her husband and she seemed trialled as an adulteress rather than a killer. The Hitchcock family knew Edith, she had been a regular customer in their grocers and her father had taught the adolescent Alfred how to dance. He understood and witnessed firsthand the media circus that surrounded the crime as well as the effects of a potential miscarriage of justice. Of course the audience should probably feel as guilty as the mob for suspecting the wrong man. Ivor Novello is effectively ominous throughout the film. His haunted, jittery expression is uncanny and mesmerising. His introduction is one of the great moments of silent and British cinema. Marie Alt as Mrs Bunting emotes a subtle dread as her creeping suspicion encompasses her. However, these performances are aided by the expressionistic shadows and Hitchcock's use of Dutch angles. The Bunting House slowly alters from a comfortable home to a place of potential danger, with Hitchcock using the familiar to achieve a sense of dread. Our directors see Wilfred Arnold and Bertram Evans build a three-sided house with the exact dimensions for walls and ceiling of a middle-class home. Using the technological skills that Hitchcock learnt in Germany, it was relatively simple to film in such tight spaces and it creating a feeling of oppression and menace. The familiar as strange. The famous shot that features the mysterious lodger pace his room as Joe and the Buntings look from the room below is a striking visual which was achieved by Novello walking on toughened glass. It is a visual in place of what would obviously be an audio a few years later, yet it remains unnerving with the unnatural camera angle and the stranger seeming to loom over their heads. In a scene that is reminiscent of Psycho, we see Daisy take a bath. She relaxes and enjoys the water in a private moment as the lodger ominously approaches the door. It turns out to be entirely innocent. Daisy completely trusts her love interest and lets her heart rule against the wishes of her family. She never once suspects him. Her mother has enough distrust for the both of them. Full of youthful enthusiasm, Hitchcock completed the shoot in six weeks. It was in this film we would receive the first of the infamous Hitchcock cameos and this was merely down to a lack of extras. His future wife Alma Revel also has an uncredited role as one of the wireless listeners. Throughout the shoot, Hitchcock's former supervisor and harshest critic, Graham Cutts, watched the production aghast at what he saw and openly derided everything about the film. When the film was finally screened for the distributor, the dreaded C.W. Wolf, alongside Balkan and Cuts, Hitchcock opted to take a long walk with Alma. When he was summoned to return to the studio, he was once again informed the film was unwatchable and the lodger would be shelved alongside the Pleasure Garden and the Mountain Eagle, a devastating blow to the 26-year-old director. To C.M. Wolfe, the film was too foreign, with its use of shadows and odd angles, believing he knew what British audiences wanted, 
Anything that resembled artistic vision was of no commercial interest and to Wolf, Hitchcock was a stubborn young upstart that refused to conform to British tastes. Balkin was dismayed at the decision. The film, having cost £12,000, was a devastating financial loss at a time when British cinema was struggling. However, the producer still believed that there was something worthwhile in the film. It was at this point he decided to contact Ivor Montague. The 23-year-old Cambridge graduate was co-founder of the London Film Society, the first film critic for The Observer and The New Statesman, and had travelled to Berlin to academically study the German film industry for the times. With such an impressive resume and an appreciation for artistic film, Balkan wanted to see what Montague thought of the lodger and the young man was immediately impressed, believing it was the most exciting original British film in years. Montague had already translated and re-edited world cinema for British audiences and offered to re-edit and advise Hitchcock, much to the director's chagrin. Fearing that he was once again facing a critic in the same mould as Wolf or Cuts, he had to be convinced that Montague shared the same appreciation and understanding of the German aesthetic and technique and he wanted to savage the film from obscurity. He suggested a couple of reshoots to better explain the plot and advised to cut down the title cards and have them redesigned by American artist Edward McKnight Coffer who emphasised the triangle motif throughout the film. The re-edit of the film was first screened at the Gainsbourg trade show with a packed audience of film critics and scholars and the reaction was beyond positive. Almost immediately, British film critics and the industry were buzzing with excitement about the film and the young director behind it. The Bioscope wrote, It is possible this film is the finest British production ever made. The Daily Mail wrote, Here is a British film which grips the imagination. The very angles at which these scenes are photographed create terror and the exquisite homeliness of the settings piles up apprehension. The lodger can more hold its own against any foreign production. It is arresting without being in any way gruesome. With such high praise, C.M. Wolfe had no option but to release The Lodger as well as Hitchcock's two previous films. Much to the delight of the studio and the director, this was not the end of Will's open disdain and dismissal of Hitchcock, but for now he remains quiet. The Lodger, the story of the London Fog, remains one of the most famous silent films ever produced. It not only introduced the world to one of the most iconic directors in the history of film, but gave the British film industry a much needed boost. It's perhaps too easy to say this is all down to the genius of Hitchcock. Montague's editing, Balkan's financial and emotional support, a capable and experienced crew with an engaging story that echoed an enduring mystery that continues to haunt the world, certainly helped. Rightly or wrongly, The Lodger continues to be one of the few British silents with an international prestige and it heralded the start of a legendary career.